Hey, church family, it is a great day for us to be together. Whatever your week has looked like, let's collectively take a deep breath, let it out. You're right where you need to be. Welcome to Hope. family. My name is Matt Curtis. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Community Church. And wherever you're watching from, whether it's gethope.tv or our friends out in Anger at our Hope at Home group, we love you guys. So excited to be together right now. Uh, Well, look, we are going to continue on in our series that we have called Why Am I Running? We'll be hearing from our Raleigh campus pastor, Dwayne Calvin. Uh, And this is what I want to say. This series has brought some new folks into our Hope Community Church family. And if you are new to Hope, there's a QR code. We just want to get to know you. We'll reach out to you, ask if there's any way we can support you or pray for you and your family. But if you can just let us know that you are new, that'd be fantastic. 
fantastic. And let me tell you this. Do you have any questions about Hope Community Church? Here's a great first step. We have Discover Online. You can go anytime on demand, gethope.net slash grow. There's a button there for 201, our Discover class. That'll help answer questions you may have about how to get connected, what your next steps are, or anything like that. Well, we have a good God who loves us and has come after us, so let's honor him with our worship. Would you stand with us as we continue to respond in worship?
Church, will you pray with me? Father God, you are our firm foundation, Lord. Uh, And some of us uh, are confused even uh, whenever we say we will build our lives on you, on a firm foundation. God, I pray that now, right now, God, you would reveal what that looks like to us a little bit more. That our faith in you, in your strength, in your character, in your goodness might grow a little bit more. That when this is over, when this message is over, God, we would follow you as our Lord. We would offer up authority over our lives to you, our authority. So God, be with us. Work in our hearts, our souls, our minds. Give us rest and peace, God, but grow us into believing you are who you say you are, and you will continue to do the things you have always done. It is in Jesus' name we say amen. Sit down at my feet You're so tired of trying to be Everything that everybody wants you to be I know I hope that you came ready to hear some good news because I came ready to share some good news tonight. Um, I want to start the good news off by just sharing a milestone that I'm about to experience in my life. Uh, On May 14th, my wife Tasha and I will have been married for 24 years, and that is good news. Let me tell you right now. Yeah. Um, And that means a couple things. That means that, one, there is a God because my wife didn't kill me. Uh, That also means that, man, we spend a lot of time together. Uh, We have a deep loving relationship and God has done a ton of things in our lives. And so we spend a lot of our time just kind of hanging out. And one of the things that we love to do is go on date night. Our kids are out of the house, we're empty nesters. So like every night is date night. Um, And we love to go watch movies together. Um, When we get to this point of the year, there's always some blockbuster coming out that we need to go see. And and typically those blockbusters surround um, some kind of superhero movie, right? Uh, There's one coming out in a few days, um, The Guardians of the Galaxy, which sounds like a pretty cool movie. Uh, I didn't see one or two, so I'm probably not going to see three or four. Um, But then there's like Spider-Man and Batman and like the Cape Crusader is kind of roaming through the streets, beating people senseless in the name of justice, right? And then there's my personal favorite that I don't quite understand. Um, Can anybody explain to me what Ant-Man is all about? Because if I got to play a superhero, I can tell you who I don't want to play. Ant, man. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with that. But here's what I know. I know that people go to those movies in droves. And most of the reason that they go to those movies is because deep inside of us, like, we kind of want to be able to do what superheroes do. We kind of want to be super. We would love to put on an iron suit and kind of fly through the air. Uh, we would love to have spidey senses. We would love to do anything that brings us to a place where our lives are like super meaningful and people really, really need us because here's why. There's a desire in every single one of us and all of us that longs for a life of significance. We all want our lives to matter. We all want to be important. And we all want to know that when we get to the end of our lives, that the life that we lived um, was really important and it made a difference in the world. And so we try our best to work as hard as we possibly can to live lives of significance and hopefully to be super and maybe even to be a hero. And hero is an interesting word because our culture kind of uses this word like really loosely. Um, We use the word hero to describe athletes. 
We use the word hero sometimes to describe military members. And, and we use the word hero sometimes to describe like superheroes. And so we use the word a lot of times. And here's the thing I've learned about a hero. Um, a hero, you kind of know it when you see it, right? Uh, it doesn't always have the same qualities, but you know one when you see one. Now, one of the people who I hold in such high regard that I have put him in the place of a hero in my life is my good friend, the pastor of Agape Church in Haiti, Pastor John Alix Paul. Um, I regard him as a hero in my life, and there's so many reasons why. Um, when I got to Hope, I served as a part of the Global Missions Department here. And if you've been around Hope for any amount of time, you know that local and global impact is extremely important to us here at Hope. We believe that God uses us um, together as we work together to make a difference all around the world. And so I would get from time to time the chance, me and my friend Doug Stride, the Apex Campus Pastor, to go overseas and visit mission partners that we have all around the world to assess their ministry, to see how God can use both of us working together. And it was a wonderful opportunity. My favorite of all of them, don't tell the others, was Haiti. <laughs> and most of it was because of John Alix Paul. Now, my first trip to Haiti, I had my worst and my best day in Haiti, right? So I show up, um, John Alix, myself, and Doug, we're driving in the car. John Alix is in the front seat, driving in the, pass on the driver's side, and I'm on the other side, sitting in the passenger seat. Doug is in the back. We put him in the back. That's just what we do with Doug. And so we're driving down the highway, and in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, it's probably the worst traffic that you will ever run into in your life. Uh, think about trying to fit 60 cars into the space of one car. That's traffic in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And so we are driving in traffic, and if you've ever been stuck in traffic before, you know that it doesn't always bring out the best characteristics of people. Um, so Pastor John Alix, my hero, is leaned across my seat, um, trying to get the people in the car next to us to understand that he needs to get into that lane. And they don't want to let him get into that lane. And they seem to be really upset. And every time we try to merge, they block us. And we try to merge and they block us. And so he is at the point where he is um, speaking clearly, right, um, across the seat. And, and uh, all of a sudden, this guy starts banging on the front of the car. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat right next to where he's banging. And I'm getting a little nervous. I'm in Haiti. Listen, I'm a military guy, but... I was a little nervous, like, like real talk. I was a little nervous. And, and so then in pure Tyler Perry, Medea fashion, this guy pulls out a pistol and kind of waves it around in the air, right? And I'm like, okay, now we're in trouble. Um, so I helped John Alix back into his seat. Um, and then I kind of asked him, like, uh, can we just not, like, yell anymore? Can we just drive? And he's like, yeah. And what was amazing to me is I asked him, I was like, man, what is that about? And he said, brother, Sometimes Haiti just like that, man. And I was amazed by his calm, right? Um, but that's not what affected me the most about that day. Later that afternoon, uh, myself, Doug, jean Alix, we drove over to the new land where Agape Church had just broke ground on a facility that they hoped to see. And he began to unpack some vision for what he wanted that church to be. He began to talk about things that he saw, uh, lives being changed, families being able to find a place to worship in the middle of what some would consider turmoil, right? Being able to come to a place, worship God, find their faith, walk by faith, live by faith, and hopefully that place was going to transform the very fabric of the nation of Haiti. And I listened to his vision, and he became a hero for me that day. He became one of my heroes. And it wasn't because he had superhuman strength. It wasn't because uh, he was somebody who was a great athlete. It was because he was living by faith. And here's the thing, as a believer, um, what we're taught in the word of God is that if we want to have lives of significance, the way that we do that is not simply through doing a bunch of stuff. We can't earn God's favor. That's not how we get to know him well. It's not even how we're supposed to live our lives. In the kingdom of God, the way that we find significant is be significance excuse me, is because of who we are. And as believers, we are supposed to be people of faith. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians kind of writes about the kind of faith that we're supposed to have. And here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says that we actually live by faith, not by sight. 
And so even when our world around us is changing, we're supposed to be people who walk in, who operate in, who move in, who live by faith. That's who we are. So how do you get heroic faith? How do you begin to live into this idea of faith that's so rock solid that when it's all said and done, God is pleased with our lives? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at a passage uh, that hopefully is a reminder for some of you, if you know your Bible, um, or if you're new to church, hopefully it's an introduction to you of something called the Hall of Faith. Um, That's what we call it. And it starts at chapter 1, and we're going to read from chapter 1 to chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and meet us over there. If you are watching at home, I want you to know that if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. It's going to be on the screen for you so you can follow along. And if you're at one of our physical campuses, we're going to have it on the screen there as well. We want you to be informed about what the Word of God says, and so we put it on the screen for you. Now, let me unpack this while you're turning over to Hebrews chapter 11. If you read the book of Hebrews, um, you can kind of capture the context. The context is that the author is writing to a group of new believers. And these are people who have recently come to faith in Christ. And there are two major goals that he unpacks from chapters 1 all the way through to chapter 10. And there's two things that are really important that he's trying to share with these new believers who have begun to feel just a little bit of persecution because of their faith in Jesus. He tries to share with them first something called the supremacy of Christ. And the supremacy of Christ simply means Christ is better. That Christ is better, better than what you ask, better than anything you could ever imagine. He's better than any plan you could ever have for your life. He's better than anything that you could ever dream of. And so the writer from chapter 1 to chapter 10, he's trying to tell people, listen, the decision you made is the right decision because Jesus is better. And he's also trying to encourage them. This is the second thing. He's trying to encourage them that in the middle of the, the, the issues that they're having, in the middle of the persecution, they need to be able to persevere. You see, the enemy of persecution is perseverance. And so he's telling them that they need to fight the good fight of faith. And that takes us right into Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Here's what it says. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Here's what I want you to do. If you're a note taker, go ahead and take out your pen right now. I want you to underline the word assurance and I want you to underline the word conviction. We're going to come back to those, okay? It says, for by it, by faith, The people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now listen, we're going to go through six chapters in this book today. I'm sorry, six verses in this book today. And what I want you to do when you get some time is go back and go through the whole of Hebrews 11. The text is rich with nuggets of truth and hope and joy. And you need to read the whole thing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing how much is in this passage. Even from the very first lines, we can see that there's a lot here. It starts out with kind of a definition, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And I told you guys to underline those two words like assurance and conviction because those are two things that are central to this idea of faith. If you want to develop faith that moves mountains, if you want to develop faith that can sustain you throughout your life, then you got to have assurance and you gotta have conviction. Let's define this idea of assurance, right? Assurance means, simply put, confidence in God. That's what assurance is. It's just confidence in God. And so you ask the question, how does one develop that kind of confidence in God? Well, here's the way that you do it. You do it by reading and applying the word of God. Now, my wife and I, we have two children. And when the kids were little and we were teaching them how to walk, right, it was a shaky situation for a little while. They would hold on to me and they would fall a little bit and then they would take a step and they would fall a little bit. And before time was too long, they started to learn how to plant their feet on the firm ground, right? And so assurance is kind of like that. Um, As we read, as we hear, as we apply the word of God, we begin to take these little steps of faith. And as we take those steps of faith, we start to find our footing. 
as we read the word of God and as we begin to apply it to how we live, we develop this confidence, like this supernatural confidence in the word of God so that even when our situation and our circumstances feel a little rocky, we know that because of the word of God that we have a firm foundation to stand on. And it creates this assurance in us, this confidence in God's word, uh, this confidence in God's plan, this confidence that we're accepted in Christ, this confidence that we have new life in Christ, this confidence that even when our lives end, that God has a plan for all of eternity. And that's a beautiful kind of confidence to have. That's assurance. It's being sure of something so much that you're able to stand on it. And so how do you develop that kind of assurance? By hearing and responding to the word of God. If you were to flip over to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says these words, that faith, that kind of faith, the assurance that we need, it comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. If you want to develop your faith, you got to hear from the word of God. And you got to begin to apply it. We all need to apply it to how we live our very lives. You see, there's some nuggets in this. <laughs> and even from this very first verse, we see two words, assurance and conviction that make a big difference in our lives. Now, the second word that we need to define here is the word conviction, okay? Uh, conviction is really important. And I'm gonna stop for a second and just tell you how I feel. This is Dwayne talking. Uh, not everybody agrees with this, but here's what I'm gonna share with you. Uh, conviction is something that we are very much lacking in our culture today. Um, I believe that part of the problem with culture at large is that we have a lot of ideas and we have a lot of feelings. And we have a lot of feelings about our ideas and we got a lot of ideas about our feelings, right? And what that creates for us is this like cosmic cycle of stuff that just keeps turning around and turning around. And what we're lacking above all else, I believe, is conviction. Conviction is a firm sense of belief. It's something that we stand on. It's this belief that's so rock solid in our lives that we will not allow it to change no matter what's happening in our world. And I think if there's a thing that we're lacking right now in culture, it's conviction. See, a lot of people have ideas, but very few of us live out of a sense of conviction. You know what convicts us like nothing else? The word of God. The word of God creates for us a foundation of conviction that we can stand on. And even when our lives get shaky and things seem problematic, we can still walk in that state of conviction, right? And it's no surprise that we're lacking conviction. I mean, we live in a culture right now who would rather go to Google than to go to God for answers, right? We live in a culture right now uh, that would rather ask Siri than asking the Savior. And so because we live in that kind of place, the truth is, is that many of us don't know what we need to be convicted about. Well, what we need to be convicted about is right all in and through God's word. As we read his word, we're convicted by it. And we find convictions that we can live our lives by. Now listen. That's just the first verse, y'all. <laughs> I told you this thing is rich. And as you continue to kind of browse through this passage, um, you're going to come to this, the, the third verse, right? The third verse of this uh, uh, chapter of Scripture. And here's what it says, just to remind you. It says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, Right? And so that's what we understand as we begin to read God's word and as we see what faith is all about. So here's what faith does. Faith gives us the power to see things that we cannot see, right? The reason why John and Leakes can stand on that land and know that there's nothing there and see a preferred future is because he's living and he's operating by faith. And because he's operating by faith, he can see things that probably the rest of us can't see yet. And so he begins to move by faith, he begins to operate by faith, he begins to walk by faith, and he's seeing things that most of us cannot see. Uh, that was really the reason why he became one of my heroes. Now, uh, let me tell you about what I mean by seeing things that nobody can see. Now listen, I am 45, um, and I know I look 44, so let's move on. 
um, I'm 45, and uh, recently I had to wear glasses. I found out that I have to wear glasses. Um, if you notice, I'm not wearing them, right? <laughs> um, my wife really gets on me about my glasses um, and because sometimes I forget to wear them. And, and when we go out to dinner, um, I may not have them, and so I can't actually read the menu in front of me. Um, so this happened about a month ago. We went out for a date night, and um, we go on a lot of date nights. Um, we went out for a date night, and we're sitting there, and I can't read the menu. And I don't want her to know that I forgot my glasses again. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there and uh, I'm like, I'm like looking at the menu and I'm like completely faking it, right? Like I'm like, <laughs> I don't want her to say anything. So I'm just like sitting there and I'm like, Lord, I need you to help me order something. Um, I know there's something on this menu I can eat and I can't see none of it. And, and, and wouldn't you know it, like right almost as soon as I said that, God provides. Because one of the waiters walked by with the most beautiful bacon cheeseburger that I've ever seen in my life. It was like a ram in the bush. I was, I was like, Lord, you just provide. Thank you so much. And so uh, I knew what I was ordering right from that moment. Like I knew exactly what to order in that moment. And so the lady comes over and she says, hey, uh, do you know what you like? Yes, yes, I want, the, I want the bacon cheeseburger. Yes, yes. I think I even said it in Spanish. I was like, hombre gasa, e papa fritas, rapido, gracia, con queso. And I don't even speak Spanish. I knew what I wanted. <laughs> And so she takes her order, takes my wife's order. She goes back to the kitchen, and then she comes back, and she says, Sir, I am so sorry to inform you that um, we don't have any more hamburgers. Um, and unfortunately, we had a meat delivery that we needed to get, and it didn't come in today, and so we don't have any more hamburgers. Now, I am furious at this point. Can you call somebody? Like, can you call Arby's? They have the meats. <laughs> I'm sitting there mad, and I got to hand this menu over to my wife, and she's ordering for me now like a seven-year-old. And she, was, she had grace upon me. She told me I needed my glasses. Um, but she ordered food for me, and it was okay. Uh, here's what I know. I know that my wife is not upset with me when I don't wear my glasses. I know that she means the best for me. And so when she asks me to wear my glasses, she knows um, that there's some things that are going to happen when I put on my glasses. She knows that they are going to inform and instruct my decisions. Like I'm going to be able to look at the menu and order something that I need. So she knows that my glasses, the way that I look through those lenses, informs and instructs my decisions. She knows that when I look at the world, including her beautiful face, everything just looks a little bit brighter when I wear my glasses. She also knows that, man, I cannot move move in the right direction if I don't have my glasses. Well, this is what we mean by how faith allows us to see things that we cannot see. You see, when we put on the lenses of faith, it changes the way that we see the world. Uh, it informs and instructs our decisions in a very special way. Uh, when we start looking at the world through the lenses of faith, we see things that maybe we never saw before. We begin to see the world in a new light. It changes how we see things. And here's what we do when we put on the lenses of faith. We begin to see the steps that we make as intentional and not accidental. And we begin to see the world in the way that God intended us to see it through the lenses of faith. You see, when we put on those lenses, it changes everything. It changes how we view the world. See what I'm saying? This passage is rich, right? As you kind of keep moving through it, um, you come to chapter 4. And here's what it says. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. These are people from the Old Testament, Abel and Cain, right? Through which he was commended as righteous, God commanding him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he also was commended as having pleased God. And here's the big one, verse six. And without faith... It's impossible to please him, God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, when you get some time, I was telling you before, I want you to read through the whole uh, area, that whole area of Hebrews 11. Uh, we call it the hall of faith. 
Uh, and the reason why is because it's full of people from the Old Testament. There are actually 17 names listed of people who at some point in their lives, for whatever reason, decided to live by faith. You see, they heard the word of God. And instead of simply just listening to the word of God, they decided to put it into action. And because they put it into action, it took their ordinary lives. And when God added what God adds, when you have faith in him, they became extraordinary lives. And these people became heroes of faith. And here's what I know, that when we walk by faith, faith leads us to lives of meaningful action. You see, faith is a verb. It's not a noun. It's meant to lead us towards action in our lives. It's meant to move us into shaping and changing the world by God's word. It's meant to encourage us and excite us about the work that's ahead. And when we begin to live by that kind of faith, you can't help but have action, right? You can't help but live it out. And these people are not in this hall of faith uh, because they were just these like uh, amazing people, right? Um, they are in the hall of faith because they learned at some point what verse 6 says, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so they put their faith into action and they begin to live lives that were pleasing to God. And over and over again in the hall of faith, it says that God commended them. Now, I was in the military, <laughs> and when you got a commendation, it was a special moment, right? It meant you did good. <laughs> Imagine God saying you did good, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. And when who you are becomes somebody who is driven by faith, it changes what you do. And these are people who found themselves in the hall of faith and they were rewarded by God because of their faithfulness. And here's what I know. I know that God rewards those who seek him. You don't have to have some kind of perfect life. Uh, you don't have to have been born a superhero to live a life of significance. Uh, what, the way that we do that in the kingdom of God is that we live a life of significance based solely and completely off of our faith. And because of that, God rewards us for our obedience. When we're obedient to God, he rewards us. And it doesn't mean that our lives have to be perfect because God is still in the business of rescuing broken people and giving them lives of significance. Why? Because of their faith. That's why. And faith leads to obedience. And God rewards obedience. You know what obedience is? Obedience is simply going public with your faith. It's being willing to live your faith no matter who's around you. You see, the people in the hall of faith, they're not there because of their supernatural abilities. And there are all kinds of names there like Jacob and, and Father Abraham and Samson, right, uh, and Samuel. There's all kinds of names there. There's 17 names in total. And then he even lists the prophets, all people who at some point decided to live by faith. And because they decided to live by faith, God rewarded them when it was all said and done. And when we get to eternity, I think we're going to be able to high five some of those people because they decided to follow God by faith. And they are broken people, right? But they realize that without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible to please God. So let me just ask you a question. What if we decided to live by faith? What if we decided to be people who just realize that there was an assurance to be found in God and we read and responded to the word of God and it built deep convictions in our lives and we decided to take what we were learning in those convictions and turn them into action 
And as we move through our world and our relationships, we put on the lenses of faith and we began to see the world the way God sees the world. So that no longer are the problems of this world the problem, they become opportunities. Even the interpersonal relationships with people who require extra grace become opportunities for you to share hope and grace with them. What if we live by faith, right? You know, um, this shows up in our stories, right? This really shows up in our stories. The people who are captured in the Hall of Faith, they have some amazing stories about following God. And I think if we were to take a roll of the stories in this room, you wouldn't hear any stories about a pretty little bow of Christianity. What you would hear is that after people stepped into faith, there was real persecution that began in their lives. After that moment that we call a moment of saving faith, things didn't get easier. <laughs> Most of the time, things got more difficult. But they knew that they had God with them. So they were able to move by faith. You see, when we're born to this earth, the story of our lives begins. And... Um, most of the time, uh, the pen that our lives are written in uh, is placed in the hand of our parents, right? And depending on how you grew up, your parents have the pen and they begin writing the story. Now, I wish our stories were written in pencil, but they're not. So we can't go back and erase them. Our stories are written in pen. And while we like to go back and through our work, maybe or, or like put a line through some of the things that happened to us, the truth is, is that our stories leave an indelible mark on our lives, even from the time of birth. And they tell a story that's full of ups and downs and problems and hurts and addictions and habits. They tell a story of brokenness. Even when the parents have the pen. And then at some point in our lives, depending on how you're raised, your parents either hand the pen off to you or you take the pen from their hands. And you begin writing this story of your life, right? And you got all the best ideas about how you're going to live a life of significance. You're going to begin to write the best story you can possibly write. And then we start writing this story and it leads to a whole bunch of activity that at the end of our lives, oftentimes, if we're honest, doesn't equal a whole lot. You know what faith is? Faith is taking that pen and putting it in the hand of God and letting him write the story. It's letting him write the story of our lives that he wants to write. And the tension with that comes because we want to get the pen back. We want to go back and we want to scribble out the things that we do even after we come to faith in Christ, right? Even after we have that saving moment of faith, we wanna go back and scribble it all out. Well, here's the good news. I told you, I hope you came ready to hear some good news because I was ready to share some. Here's the good news. Because of us putting our faith in Jesus by putting a pen in his hands, he has the power to erase any indelible mark that is on our lives. And when our Father in heaven sees us and we are walking by faith. He sees us without spot or blemish. Because we're covered by Jesus. And today, maybe you are here. And maybe at some point in your life, you put the pen in God's hand. And you realize that you have probably taken it back. And maybe you have stopped surrendering by faith. Maybe conviction doesn't convict you anymore because you're not in the word of God. Well, I want to invite you to renew your relationship with Jesus today. You can start today and put the pen back in his hand where it belongs. Or maybe you're here today and you have never had a saving moment of faith. A moment where you say, God, I just, I tried to do everything I could. I threw up my hands. I'm going to put this pen in your hand and I'm going to begin to walk by faith, beginning with my faith in you. Well, you can have that kind of a moment today. You can stop running 
towards the world's standard of a life of significance. You can begin to have a life of significance found through faith in Jesus Christ. In a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. And let me just say, there's nothing special about the prayer that we're about to pray. It's in and of itself is not the thing that saves you. God does the work of saving. And he saves us through grace by your faith. What this prayer is, is an opportunity for you to publicly declare, for you to just voice the words and cry aloud to God that you have faith in him. So if you're here, you already know who you are. So let's just take a moment and pray together. Father God, um, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. Um, we thank you that as we share your word and as we shared in your word tonight, that we know that it doesn't return void. We know that it accomplishes everything that you have for it to accomplish. And so we find joy in that in and of itself. But we also know that there are some here tonight who may not be walking with you. And so, Father, um, we want to lift these humble prayers up before you and ask that you would fill those who don't know you with your spirit and that you would help them to walk a life of faith. That you would receive them into your arms as they are running towards you and away from the things of this world. So if you are somebody who'd like to do that, let's just pray these words together. Father God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that I've been trying to write my own story. I realize that the story that you want to write in my life is better. And so at this moment, I want to put my trust in you. I want you to write my story in the way that you want to write it. I put my faith in you. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me by your word. Help me to walk by faith for all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for listening. Well, what a powerful testimony from Pastor John Aleeks and a great word from Dwayne. All of us, uh, we can continually be reminded of faith and what our faith looks like. And that may be new for you, uh, and we want to know. Look, if you have had one of those uh, saving faith moments that Dwayne talked about, if you raised your hand, uh, or even if you're just curious about that, we want to have conversations with you about that. You can open up the chat right now and let us know that you have questions. But also, if you have made the decision to follow Jesus, and I mean in the last few weeks, if you have made that decision, uh, we would love for, this is what you have to do when you're on online campus, right? We have a form for you. If you can go to gethope.net slash next, there is a button on there that says, I made a, G a decision to follow Jesus. You just click that. It's a quick form, and we want to follow up with you and hear your story, get to know you, and how can we help you further that relationship. Uh, well, look, this weekend at all of our campuses, we are taking that word from Dwayne, that gospel message from Dwayne, and we're also honoring communion. Uh, communion is an opportunity for us really to remember what God did through Jesus on the cross and in the power of the resurrection. So we're going to release you to that momentarily. But before I do, uh, we've talked about our family conversations for the last several weeks. And this is something families defined a bunch of different ways. They don't all look the same for sure. But this is something we just want to take this word and these challenges into our homes, into our cubicles, into the environments that we're in. So the question that's posed today is how would you personally define faith? I'm going to have to think on that one. I'll be on. Last week, we had a good family conversation. I asked my uh, seven and five year olds if they'd received something that they don't deserve from God. And, I, and the answers were forgiveness, then love, then TV. Then we had an argument about if we deserve TV or not. So, but we're talking about it. It's okay. We're growing. So that's the conversation this week is how would you personally define faith? Look, we love you guys. We'll see you next week.